Welcome to Skid the Library on this beautiful morning, Chats with Champions. Chats has a 15-year history of presenting programs that span the interests of all segments of our community. Our next two chats are on Tuesday, September 6th, when we will welcome Jack Kennedy, a local real estate broker, who has managed to bring treatment for malaria to a small Indonesian island. And on Thursday, September 15th, Kevin Hancock, the CEO of Hancock Lumber, and author of Not For Sale, Finding Center in the Land of Crazy Horse, will be here to speak about his book. Chats is sponsored by Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop. Today our speaker is Steve Raymond. Steve is the Director of Community Outreach and Marketing at the Lincoln Home in Newcastle, and the producer and host for the television show Spotlight on Seniors. Raymond is a longtime senior care professional and is a skilled counselor helping families navigate the complexities of older age. Many people know that they should plan for this in the years, but they have no idea where to begin. In his talk, he will give an overview of senior living choices from Camden to Brunswick. He will discuss the complexities of the choices we make in our later years. It is my pleasure to introduce Stephen. Thank you, Karen. Uh, before I go into my topic, I want to acknowledge first of all the magnificent space of the Skidonfa Library, which I've been learning more about because I was delighted to have Pam and her colleague Carolyn Anthony on the Spotlight on Senior Show. I had never known that they had won a national award for this library, so uh, for me, you all are to And then uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, colleagues of mine in the audience here. Uh, Karen Filler, first of all, who introduced me, is a member of our board. Sharon White is also a member of our board. Lynn Norgang is our executive director. And um, I don't want to be a coy because part of my job is selling the Lincoln home. I'm not going to be doing that today, but I don't want to pretend that I don't absolutely love working there. And the big reason that I love working there is an absolutely special and unique community, which if anybody's ever interested to hear about, that's just call and we'll talk about that. I'm not going to focus on that today. But the other reason is we have a board of directors that is very deeply engaged in what we're doing. They're, they're professionals and um, we're a nonprofit. And so they really lean in and participate in all that we're doing. And our executive director, Lynn Norgang, uh, has been at the helm there for, I guess, 18 years now, Lynn? So probably longer than you want to admit. So. Just gonna move right in. Yeah, I just gonna move right in. <laughs> so, there's, when we talk about aging, um, so I've been in healthcare, when Lynn was a young person at here, and, and, and it's the same for me, I was 24 years old uh, when I became a registered nurse. And, well, it's different when you're 24 and working with people who are older. And then you go into your 30s and 40s and 50s, and now I'm, I'm in my 60s. And I'm older enough that I get it. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I don't feel that far behind you. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm coming, coming, coming right up behind you. I have enough of a personal perspective um, that that it actually gives me uh, great joy and pleasure in my work now because I, my, my partner is also a senior care professional, Joe Wallace. We're both aging ourselves. We're both constantly in conversations with other people who are facing these issues. And so this is our life right now. What we enjoy doing is counseling, helping people find the right direction. There are upscale communities all along the coast, and as a matter of fact, throughout the state, when I really did the research, there's no reason for me to say, what I'm about to say today really applies through much of the state. Um, there are upscale communities that a lot of people simply won't be able to afford. And as a matter of fact, in my own personal life, I will don't see myself really coming into one of the, quote, upscale communities just because of finances. Who knows, maybe. We'll see how it all settles out. In my work every day, and the work of the Lincoln Home, we are, quote, an upscale community, but we serve all levels of this community. And a 
great deal of my time is uh, spent counseling people who would not be able to afford to live in Lincoln Home, but uh, <clears throat> I'm always wanting to help them find the right resource, and so that's what we do. We're, we're resource connectors, and we're fortunate that in Lincoln County here, which most of you have probably heard, but Maine is the oldest state in the country. Lincoln County is the oldest county in the state. We own it. Yay. <laughs> and um, so we are blessed with a lot of rich resources here in this county. And because of the spotlight on Senior Show, I end up being in, in so this week I had House Speaker Mark Eves on. Uh, previously, Jess Maurer of the Maine Council on Aging. So there's things that are going on in the state, and we all are aging within a social context. That, that's the context of Maine. And what that means is that every day, there are 26 Mainers turning 65 years old every single day. And we, so that's about 9,000 a year. And at the same time, we have kind of a shrinking younger population. And our, the Maine is kind of on the cutting edge of the country in, in this regard, and it's called demographics. And we're kind of headed towards looking kind of like Japan. That's where it's going. We, we, we're going to have a much larger senior population of 80 and 90s, much larger in 70s, much larger in the 60s. And so for people who are now, say, of the baby boom generation, we're in our 60s now and, and headed towards our 70s, um, what aging looks like in Maine, say, 10 years from now is going to look very differently even than it looks right now. So when you're making your plans and you're thinking about how am I individually going to navigate these tricky waters, which I liken to very much our waterways right here. You know, there's so many different avenues that people can travel. So we want to be able to give some forethought to, well, what are we thinking about? Um, and there's so many different ways that we can talk about this. One of them is, so for example, we could just talk about the emotional issues. Today I'm focused on the practical, but I'm going to mention a couple of the emotion issue, emotional issues. One is people make promises to each other in married couples. And they make those promises when they're a lot younger. And the promise is, typically, we either make promises or we extract promises. I've never put you in a, quote, nursing home. Or don't ever put me in a nursing home. And where that sentiment came from was there was a time when there were a lot of horror stories about places like that. Those horror stories are simply no longer true. Well, the environment is completely different now. It's very much a consumer protected environment. It's a very regulated environment. And I, in getting to know colleagues from many different communities, everybody that is drawn to this kind of work, they are uh, they're professionals and they have compassion. And so we, I, I'm a big believer in professional compassion because we're all each an individual and unique soul, essence, however you want to think about it. But we are radically unique, and we have a unique story by the time we get to we're older. So how are we supposed to think about these things? It'd be a lot easier if we had a crystal ball. I wanted a crystal ball, so went down to Reddy's. <laughs> the wall. If we knew how our health was going to go, because when I was in my 50s, when I was 57 years old in the same year, I had three friends, three men friends, in their 50s die sudden deaths. And I bet many people here have some experience and story like that, something you just didn't expect. And then 
someone ends up with Parkinson's disease and they're only in their 60s, or someone ends up with MS, or someone. So the things that happen to us aren't really all just related to aging. It's not just that you can say, oh, when I'm 80, I'm going to be in trouble because we have people that are 80 and very engaged in the community and very purposefully living and doing their work and they're, they're amazing. And then previously when I facilitated a uh, uh, memory care Alzheimer's uh, support group for early stage people who had been recently diagnosed, and I spent a couple years doing that, I had people in the group who were in their 50s, 60s even. So we just don't know. We don't have the crystal ball. But I don't want to have uh, what I would call a tragedy narrative around aging. And one of the reasons I made the point about a lot of the things that happen to us really aren't connected. They're somewhat connected to age, but there's things that happen that just start. We're trying to change how people are approaching aging at this time of their lives. And, um, there's a lot of things that we as a culture come to believe about getting older that A, don't serve us, and B, limit the kinds of decisions that we're willing to make. Uh, one of the promises I talked about before was the idea, please never place me in a quote nursing home, don't, I will never do that to you. The other one is, and I see it all the time here, um, it's that somehow there's a higher um, moral value in just sticking it out in a house which was beautiful to you, served your family, you grew your family in, you loved, you're attached to, um, but that people end up sometimes kind of in a trap. And what ends up happening is that we end up having to deal with <laughs> We end up having to deal with more complexity at a time when complexity is difficult to deal with. And so, you know, you got the 3,000 foot square foot house and you got the barn full of stuff. And, and I have these conversations all the time. Just yesterday, someone who built a magnificent business, incredible house, but she's really in a point where it's really virtually impossible for her to handle the complexities. How do I now handle this and make some other kinds of decisions? So I don't want to labor this too much, but what I guess what I would say is my invitation to people is always to try to open up your perceptions and not get stuck in promises or commitments or beliefs that you formed in your 50s because it's very different by the time we get to 80 by the time we get to 90. So, money is a great insulator. That's the society we live in, right? If you have a lot of money, there's choices and decisions that you can make that otherwise uh, you're not able to make. And we all have accepted living in this society all this time. That's what we live in now. So I want to talk about first the, I'm going to talk about the upscale communities first. And I'm going to say some numbers that will shock you because sometimes people think, okay, well, I'll just go into assisted living, but they don't really know the cost. Right now, what we would call the upscale communities, and I mean places like Quarry Hill and Bartlett Woods and Lincoln Home and Chase Point and all the, all the communities that have registered nurses on staff, they have activity directors who really set the pulse of the community and keep it vibrant and active and they have fine dining and they have their own kind of beautiful sorts of uh, characteristics in their community. You're not going to pretty much anywhere in Maine, I, I don't really look at a rustic, but anywhere south, you're not going to get into one of those places for less than 70000 a year. That's what they cost, the upscale communities are 70000 a year bottom line to walk in. The nature of the regulated environment is that um, they also usually have a financial qualification process for people to come in and you have to show, be able to show at least a couple years, maybe three years of the ability to actually pay for the care. So 
that's kind of a bottom end. And now the cost of all senior care, no matter where it is and what it is, is basically a combination of housing and the quality of housing. So, you know, if I have a 3,000 square foot house on Linden Street with a nice deck in the water, that costs A, X amount. And then somewhere else uh, in Lewiston would cost B. That's how it is in, in uh, housing and senior care. Um, so in the Lincoln home, we have some really beautiful apartments we built. They're two bedrooms, a thousand square feet. They're looking out in the water. You go, wow, when you walk in, those are more costly than our lovely kitchenette studios, which are at that 70,000 per year lower end marker. And that's, so all, the, all of our senior care communities, we all check on each other. We talk to each other. I got a call from Chase Point a couple weeks ago. Where, where, where do you guys set your rates? And yeah, okay, you, you tell me what your rates are. Everybody stays in the same ballpark. There's minor differences, but we're kind of all in, all in the same place. And I think in terms of cost, uh, what we're talking about assisted living, in terms of cost, um, uh, that 70000 that's a reliable marker for you to think about. Now, yes? Can I just ask a question? Yes. When you say $70,000, is that assisted living? Yes. That's right where I was going just now. So okay. What is assisted that, that is assisted living. And um, so I'm going to distinguish independent living, assisted living, memory care, um, and then nursing home care. Uh, and what I want to do to introduce assisted living, so the way all senior care professionals uh, look at a person coming into their community is how much nursing care is it going to require. And so there's what we call activities of daily living. And by the way, I didn't give this to you beforehand because you'd be reading it instead of listening to me. But <laughs> at the end of it, all the information I talk about here is in these handouts that I will have for you. So, picture for, I can't read here. Picture for example, how am I going to demonstrate? I'm just going to demonstrate. So, someone who is, uh, needs assistance from a chair requires a nurse to help them up. You know, usually we can do that ourselves, but some people reach the point where they can't quite get there and they need a boost. And then, sometimes people get to the point where they actually need one person on each side, one person on this side, and one person on this side. Or some people may need assistance with, say, getting into the shower. Um, we have one gentleman here with a walker, so he has uh, mobility limitations. So that's the kind of thing that professionals are looking at, and it's the same language in every community. It doesn't matter where you go. <coughs> Excuse me. And on the back page of the handout, it lists them all. But what we're looking at is assistance with bathing and dressing and uh, getting in and out of the shower and transferring from a bed to a chair, that type of thing. So administrators, they're, what they do is they have a, they, they're able to estimate, well, how much nursing care does the person really need? Cost, again, is A, part of the quality of the housing. B, is the level of assistance that the person needs. In assisted living, we talk about level one and level two care. So if a person needs assistance with say two of the activities of daily living, level one care. They need assistance with three or more, it's level two. In our memory care unit, we allow, uh, so it, then it goes up to four uh, ADLs. And so every community will have its own nuance and how they look at those things, but that's the language that they're using to uh, try to calculate those things. Um, so we said quality of housing, the amount of services that are needed, and um, that those are the two real driving factors in what dictates the cost of assisted living. Now, independent living is different. We have independent apartments. Someone comes in, 
And they could be independent or kind of semi-independent. The reason people come into independent living is so they have a, a nice vibrant support system around them in case they feel changes that are occurring and so there's a support system around. And plus, <clears throat> generally someone that comes into independent may be thinking that when they're down the line, they want to go to assisted living. Um, <clears throat> there's two there's, been, there's two ways to understand independent living. One of them is that it uh, is an ownership model. And one of them is that it's a month-to-month -month rental model. And it's kind of like renting an apartment. You sign a one-year lease. So the Highlands is an example of an uh, ownership model. Schooner Cove over, over here in the, the Miles campus is an ownership model. The Cost generally at the bottom end are about two hundred and forty thousand. They scale up to four hundred and fifty thousand, and then you're paying about two thousand a month in fees to, to be able to stay there. Uh, there's a theme that I come back to for myself. I know that I don't want to be entering more complex contracts when I'm older and getting. I, I, I'm always looking for simplicity instead of complexity, and. Mm -hmm. To me, one of the criticisms of that, of that system of ownership is uh, that, first of all, you know, it's easy to buy in, but it's hard to get out because you can only sell through their system. And um, so, for example, the Highlands right now, and I know the professionals there, I actually live very close to their great folks. It's a great community. But in terms of their independent houses and cottages that they sell, they have 24 units on them. And those people, a lot of them have been on there for a long time, and you can spend a year or more paying off, paying fees as you're trying to sell out. Um, and memory care, I want to mention, because sometimes people reach a point where, in just in terms of, um, um, well, memory issues and the ability to really take care of themselves in their own home or a family caregiver. Um, uh, there, so they might call them Alzheimer's units or memory care. That's a big demand here. It's a, it's a huge demand. Um, most of the memory care units are pretty full most of the time. There's a new Alzheimer's uh, community being built in Brunswick called Anita. So they'll be able to take take more of that. But it's um, if if one is looking at memory care, I think it's very good to try to plan ahead and try to connect with communities. And one of the pieces of advice I give, and so usually, okay, it's a spouse that has a person that needs assistance, or it's a, a dutiful daughter who has a parent that, that is going to need assistance. If you see this happening, don't wait until the last minute. Kind of look at the communities, do your advanced homework, visit them, see what appeals to you, learn the details of the costs and everything. And what I say to people is, because so many of them are full, so get an application into the, say, maybe two communities that you really want to be in. Because a lot of times when people wait, what ends up happening is that a sudden event occurs. And now you're in kind of crisis and you don't have any preparations made. So it's nice to be able to pivot uh, to you have your application in and you call the counselor in that community and you're looking at you know do they have available beds and so that you so that you're kind of a, a few steps ahead in the process because again any of the upscale communities there's the application process there's paperwork there's things you have to go through in order to to uh, be able to get in. So I want to talk about a different level of care, assisted living care, and that's residential care communities. And I'm a huge supporter of the elder care network here in, in uh, uh, Lincoln County. They have seven community homes. They are a main care uh, community, but they also take private pay, and uh, they're. It, it, I, they're unique in the state, actually. It's a model I wish was created in other areas of the state. 
so yes. What does that mean? They're a main care community, but they also take private pay. What is a main care community? So a main care community, main care is, uh, well, it's essentially, it's a, it's a social welfare program, and it's for health care related causes. And so uh, the thing about main care is it will, it can pay for assisted living, it can pay for nursing home care, it can pay for some in-home care. You have to go through a qualification process, but here's the thing. Right now, there's nowhere near enough main care beds in the state. And there never will be. We'll never be able to catch up with uh, the ability to meet the need of people that might require that level of care and that level of financial assistance. Um, so a smart move that I say to people is if you don't think your assets, the assets that you have, if you don't think the assets that you have would get you into one of the more expensive communities, the smart thing to do is not wait till you totally run out of money, but find a way to sell your home or transition your assets and go into one of the uh, main care communities that will accept private pay. And if you spend your assets down there, then you're able to convert to main care and receive that assistance. But otherwise, you're in a very long waiting list to be able to get in. Um, and as a, there's a, to me, there's another good reason to be doing that for people not to wait for the last minute. Because again, you go into crisis and everything is challenging and difficult. If you actually spend your assets down in that community, you're, you're contributing to a system that needs the cash flow. And I, I personally, I think that's a, a good thing because it helps keep the main care system going. Uh, separate, so in a, in a, in a uh, residential care, they're called. So the cost for residential care at that level is $4,500 per month. So that's $50,000 per year. That's still expensive for a lot of people. Some people aren't going to be able to handle that. But if you have the ability to spend down about a year or two of assets in that community, it puts you in a better position to be able to receive assistance. Um, you know, public housing is something else I wanted to mention. Uh, I live in Sagatahawk County, and so, so we have Lincoln and Sagatahawk. And public housing, um, in Brunswick, they've done pretty well with it, actually, in terms of what they've created here. Lincoln County has not quite accomplished what they've done in some other regions. So public housing, um, <clears throat> there was a study by the Maine Housing Authority. Um, uh, and right now, currently, we are uh, 9,000 units short of what they would wish to have. And it's about a five-year waiting list to get into public housing, and some people have that idea, you know, I'll go into affordable senior care when that time comes, just as though, okay, I can just decide to go in. It's not, it's, it's not like that. You need, you need to do the research and get on a list early on if you think you're going to have to head in that route. Because so many of us are getting older and people are in situations like they're on a fixed income and property taxes go up, it's more expensive to maintain your house, you need a new roof, or you need to paint, or you, you know, it gets more difficult for people if you rely on a limited income. So, I don't want to stay on that, but just know that public housing is a big issue. Um, home care, people sometimes tell themselves, well, I'll have some help come in for the home. Uh, like certified nurses aides to come into the home. And that can be a good answer. That can be a, a, a partial answer uh, because it's expensive. Um, and so I've been, uh, I have run, this is, I'm a director of this home care agency with Lincoln Home, and I only run in California, and I was a director of another one. I've seen it for a long time. Just in terms of pure cost, home care, by the time you get to about eight hours worth of care, six to eight hours worth of care, just in terms of dollars, <laughs> just in terms of dollars, um, you might as well be in an assisted living because the, the home care costs around here, even the private caregivers, if you 
Well, let's put it this way. Full-time home care can, would cost you between 15000 and 18000 per month. It's a lot of money. And even the private caregivers, they're charging up in, they're charging up in that uh, level. So if you're saying assisted living in even a, 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 an upscale place, where in our place you can come in and have a water view studio and a nice little kitchenette, and it's going to cost you a little over 6000 a month, home care, you know, it's as a long-term solution, it's hard unless you have a lot of assets. Um, um, we do want to talk about family caregivers. And I'm, I'm, you need me to wrap, or where are we, how are we doing? Okay. Okay. Uh, I did want to talk to say one thing about family caregivers. Um, so all these things can sound pretty grim, you know? And I don't like to sound like that, but I like to be reality-oriented. I actually really believe that our older age, one of the reasons I say to embrace simplicity instead of staying in complexity is because complexity steals your life. It steals your mental life. It steals your emotional life. And if you're, to me, our aging years are times when we open up our hearts and open up our minds and, and let ourselves move into a different phase without constantly worrying about solving this detail and that detail and this problem and that contract and these problems with people that we're trying to work with. For me, I recognize simplicity after the complexity of our professional lives and our family lives and all that is better. Philosophically, for me, it's better. Family caregivers, um, we were talking about ADLs before. Family caregivers sometimes get into a situation where, um, frequently get into a situation where A, they hurt themselves, uh, or B, it just grinds their health down so much because the stress factor is actually pretty tremendous when, when uh, you carry it out over a long time. You know, if it's for a short term, for a year or two, but then you see people taking care of someone for five years, six years, many years. And so I told you I was a nurse, right? And when I was younger, in the hospitals especially, it's always, you know, and plus I was stronger than them. They'd always come to the man to help them assist. I can tell you I've assisted, who knows, hundreds, thousands, it's, it's 20 years in hospitals, so it'd have to be thousands. On my own father, which was unbelievable to me, but it has happened, I was helping him from this position to help him into his bed, and all of a sudden, all of his weight collapsed upon me, and it tore the cartilage in my knee. And I'm a professional. People underestimate the deep, deep challenge of being a family caregiver. And they get locked into promises that were made, and promises that become increasingly hazardous to try to keep. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I want you to come back to that point. I'm going to come to just kind of a close and, and um, we can talk about things and answer any questions. But I do want to say I have this expression and it's just personal philosophy. With, 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 get off the carousel while it's still moving. Find something more simple for yourself don't let things grind to a halt. Talk to families. Talk to if you have professional finance counselors, attorneys, estates, advanced directives. All the different pieces that you can actually look at, kind of with, look at it with a clear eye. And um, you have to understand how it's going to be for you, what's going to be best for you individually. And uh, I'll just leave it at that for now. Any questions? I'm sorry. Uh, the, on the uh, home care, you, you said the full time for a month. Uh, for a month. What would be if somebody came in, like you said, for six to eight hours? Would you give me an idea? Uh, the costs are typically ranging uh, right now from we're seeing about twenty three to twenty seven fifty per hour. Um, another point worth mentioning is so there's there's a, a a lot of private caregivers out there, they're charging pretty close to and sometimes as much as what the agencies charge. And one of the hazards about that is they're not covered by workers' compensation. 
And not that it happens often, but it happens. All of a sudden, someone hurts their back, they have an injury, they've done it on the job in your property. When the state gets involved, if they report an injury, when the state gets involved, you're definitely the employer. There's no independent contractor. And I've definitely seen it happen. Uh, the other thing is payroll taxes. I've definitely seen that the, uh, um, if it gets found out that you can be liable for even a couple of years worth of payroll taxes for a worker that you were paying cash to. So if, if you're looking at costs and you're seeing, you know, an agency charging 24, 25 an hour, and you're seeing a private caregiver charging 22 or 23 or 25 an hour, I would say, you better go with an agency because that, as a third party, they have all those protections in place. Stephen, are the private ones all licensed? They're registered. They're registered. It's, in Maine, it's uh, registered with the state. It's not licensed. And that's, that's one of the things that are they're, they're regulated minimally. They're regulated as a business regulation, but not a Department of Health Service regulation. And that does, so the distinction is there's home health where a doctor has an order and they send out nurses, but that's, you know, for an hour at a time to treat something very specific. What we're talking about is the CMAs that come in the home for bathing, dressing. Yes? Um, if a person enters a facility like Lincoln Home and has long-term care, how does that apply? Long -term yeah, long-term care insurance. What was the question? Uh, thank you. Uh, she asked about long-term care insurance and how it works. Um, so if you're lucky enough to have long-term care insurance, especially if it was purchased, uh, say, more than 10 years ago, and it was selling a lot of really great policies at that time, and they can, so the way it works is that the, the uh, community provides the documentation to the uh, insurance company. Um, there's gonna have to be a doctor's order for you to come in they're going to have to certify that there's an actual need. There's the considerations such as the maximum benefit that will get paid. There's the consideration of what's called the elimination period, which is similar to a deductible on health insurance. And so uh, the best thing is when, if you're talking to us or another community, you know, you let them know you have long-term care. We help work it out with the insurance companies to see what, what's going to happen. It's uh, pretty complex, and there's a lot of new products coming out with insurance brokers. Uh, but it's a good product, especially if you bought it a number of years ago. So at what level would you no longer be able to stay in Lincoln Home? Well, that, okay, I'm glad you asked that, actually. So <clears throat> we had done uh, last summer a, uh, a number of focus groups in the community. And um, so one perception is that you reach a certain level of sickness in a Lincoln home and you have to go to cold sedge. And that's really a radical misperception. I did look back at every single, the records on every single resident that we had in the last 10 years. That happens actually pretty rarely. Like it was about 17% or something like that. It was, it was a relatively small number. We have, uh, and, and on the other hand, we're, committed to trying to have people stay with us in their home, which is the home we're managing, until the end of their lives. And that happens fairly frequently, a much higher percentage than I, than I ever imagined. And not to make it too simple, but uh, so I'm a person who's been with hundreds of people at the time of their death, actually. So I, what, what you see is in seniors, there's kind of two different kinds of death experiences. Let's <laughs> stand over here and turn this out. Um, there's two different kinds of death experiences. One of them is uh, kind of like the winding down of a clock or a glider coming in for a landing. And by the way, I want to say, as someone who has been with with hundreds of people at the time of the death. There can be some very beautiful death experiences. Death is not necessarily, well, I'm a big believer in trying to expand into what's happening in your life at the moment. And whether it's aging or we have to deal with a new disability or at the time of our death, we have two choices. One is to go like this or one is to go like this. And the people that I see doing best in life at every step of the way 
they may go through some struggle with it, but you end up going like this each step of the way, 60, 70, 80. And so, and the other, so, and, and many of our people that stay with us at Lincoln Home, it's like that. It's the glider coming in for a landing. It's simple, we, we have hospice care, and you know, we come to be, be very connected to our residents there. We vastly prefer someone to stay with us. Then sometimes it's a little different. Someone may have a disease and there's body systems that are kind of going crazy and they reach the point where we actually can't provide the level of care that would be required and they become, sometimes what happens is they go to a nursing home, and, I mean to the hospital and then to a nursing home. And it's too much for us to be able to take back just within our, uh, for example, if a registered nurse needs to be on staff for 24 hours, um, I mean not on staff, um, in the building for 24 hours, or if it's, uh, if it's just really nursing home care. That happens, like I said, very rarely. What, what happened? She had a, a follow-up. Oh, okay. I could feel it coming, but it was like... <laughs> okay, so hmm, you're on your way out. So are you going to be staying in a garden apartment, or are you going to be moving into some other kind of facility? No, you, no, no. You stay, you, you stay right in you you, your apartment. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And what happens then as your, your nursing needs, perhaps, Increase there as you're gliding toward the end. <clears throat> what are you? Yeah. Every month is the bill going up? Um, no, it's not, it's not based on that. So there's a couple options. So the gliding towards the end thing, usually when people are doing that, it's not a long, you don't see it like a long glide path. Uh, when you agree, Lynn, typically it's not, it's not that people are doing that for a long time. That's why it's thought of as one of the kind of ideal. Uh, ways to exit, I guess I would say. Personally, I hope I have a few months to know it's coming uh, instead of just like, boom, you're out. Um, and that seems to be the way it works. The people that are on the glide path, they're kind of going along, going along, going along. And then there's a decline that goes on for a relatively short period of time. If care needs get to be too much, some, sometimes we may, uh, there may be a slight cost in like, uh, so they might have a private duty caregiver that is with them for a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours at night, but it doesn't really escalate the cost that much. And what if, it's, it, 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 <clears throat> what if that goes on for several years? Well, that, I, that's a different kind of experience. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, you could project something like that, but if someone became nursing home level care, there's, it's not that there's never a time where we wouldn't have someone go to a nursing home. You know, if it just becomes more than we can possibly handle with our own care staff. And then especially, uh, there's a lot of medical complexities going on. And so it requires that 24-hour nursing staff on duty. That's what you get in a, in a nursing home that does not occur in assisted living. So yes, sometimes they would go to a nursing home. But, but I think I understand you to say that the in-between in cases there are not very frequent. Yeah, I, uh, to me, surprisingly, less, way less frequent than I thought when I first started looking at that data going back 10 years. I was really, because they, they keep track of all admissions, discharges, why they were discharged, where they went to. And you know, for us, a lot of times you have sometimes people, they might stay with us for a couple of years and then they go, oh, I'm going to North Carolina to live close to my daughter, you know, that kind of thing. As a practical matter, do you run into cases often, or how often, where uh, people are finding themselves staying in their apartment, but finding themselves increasingly pinched by nursing or medical requirements, but not, not enough to, to, uh, to transfer them to a nursing home. Yes. Are you talking about in our place yes. or in their private yes. homes? Um, no, not really. Not really, but what, what, how would you answer well, that? Well, as people, yes, I, I think there's a, it's fair to say it's the longer they're there, they, their uh, mobility may change, their cognition may change, mm -hmm. their needs will change, but we are committed to be able to meet those needs. 
without increasing the rate substantially? To a certain level, yes. We do have two levels of care. Um, and Steve kind of talked about sometimes as people get very close to death, if the family doesn't want them to be alone, or we feel that there's a safety risk, we might ask that a private caregiver be there. If the family doesn't have the resources, our staff is planning their own. We've had people whose family really wanted them to die in a hospital, and our staff was over there. Right. And there's no charge for that. Right. I mean, there's a lot of heart in, in, in this work, whether it's Lincoln Home or anywhere else. Yeah. Because there just it has to be. So there, there can be some incremental but there isn't always an exotic I think the specific thing you know, that you're referring to is that, uh, so level one and level two care. So in, in our community, level two care uh, adds $1,200 to the cost. Per month. Per month, right. And so you'll find that as a common, that, and I think that's what you're looking for. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get it specifically. But so every community will have, so there's level one, and then as the care needs do increase, level two comes up. And you know, when people are coming in, that's part of what you're looking at in terms of projecting future costs. Anybody else? if someone has to transfer to a nursing home from an assisted living community, is it up to the family to just do their own homework and find where to go, or do they receive assistance from the community? And I would say virtually any community uh, is going to provide that assistance. They're not just going to throw it to you and say, okay, you figure it out. Um, the typical cost of nursing home care, if you're talking about uh, private, uh, private pay care, it's twelve thousand dollars per month and up. Yes. Excuse me. Having just gone through this whole process with my father within the past year, um, I can just say it's a very difficult process for the person making the decisions, but it's a very worthwhile process for where, you know, in my case, my father ended up. But there were a lot of things to consider in making the choices. And I'm sorry, I missed the first few minutes. I don't know if you mentioned this, Steve, but um, things like the um, ratio of staff to residents is, I think, very important. Um, the attitude, and I know you did mention the fact that um, people that go into the profession are so dedicated. And I was in a situation where I found a place um, for my father that I can't believe how supportive the staff are. Um, and just the environment, and you have to go visit the places. Don't just look at the brochures, because they all look pretty in the brochures, but um, just get the feel of how similar it is to where um, your family member or you are used to living. What, what's the, a good match? Um, there are wonderful places out there. Um, and just proximity is really important. If you plan to visit, um, or people plan to visit you, it's a lot easier if you land right around the corner. Yeah, so just for the video, what Becky mentioned was um, the, uh, I guess I would say the morale of the staff. That's what I want to Because you can walk into a beautiful place, but if you see everybody walking around kind of grumpy, and, uh, that makes a difference. Uh, uh, one of the things I love about the land at home is we have an incredibly positive uh, group of people working there, every level, every level of care. That really does, uh, you know, it's, the, it's a people kind of situation, actually. So, for example, if you go into a hospital, let's say you went into Miles, and the person in one room has, you know, the angel nurse, and and uh, they have one experience of that hospital because that nurse has done so much for them and such a great feeling. And the person in the next room has the nurse that, uh, the nurse ratchet, yeah, <laughs> and is going and is going through some life difficulty or is crabby or whatever, and they write complaints to the hospital and, and it gets projected upon the whole hospital. 
possible. So the staff really is everything there. Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, kind of bring it to a close now. And I'm going to repeat something I said. I, I don't like to sound corny about it, but, but it's good advice. It really is good advice. And I mentioned it before. We're, we're, we're kind of challenged in our lives as to, um, well, we don't stop growing. You know, uh, you, you get, you're in your 70s, you're in your 80s, you're in your 90s, you're still going through an experience, and it doesn't matter if there's some cognitive diminishment. It doesn't matter if you don't remember things as well as you used to. They matter, but it's, there's something different. It's, there's, there's a shift of focus to your inner self and to your relationships with your loved ones and to how you open up your heart to meet the invitation of the moment of this present moment in your life. And then all those moments that lead you towards, you know, that journey that we're all on and that we all, that we all go through. So um, I approach life like full of gratitude for every day. I actually really do. Um, because if you think about it, the mere fact that we even exist and we get to share these experiences, it's like, it doesn't matter if you believe in a great cosmic God or if you or if you just think we evolved. It's like, oh my God, the fact that we even exist is mind blowing. It's kind of a miracle, and um, it's uh, it, and if you approach all these challenges, kind of opening them up into them, having watched many people go through that journey at the end, I can tell you, it's a lot easier when we do it that way. So that's my personal piece. Thank you.